Um, when I was asked to introduce this, I, I did a little research to try to understand who this, who this Flynn guy was. And to my surprise, this lecture is not named after Errol Flynn, uh, nor is it named after Michael Flynn, contrary to those would both lead to rather different lectures, I think, than what we're going to hear today. Uh, it is rather named after John Flynn, uh, who was an eminent member of this department uh, for many years. He was the first director of the Ribicoff Research Facilities uh, here at CMHC. And it was really his work and vision that set the agenda of this department to bring together basic and clinical science with the best in clinical care in uh, what was one of the first truly translational psychiatric enterprises uh, in the country, setting the path of the department um, for the decades since then. Uh, the Flynn Lecture began in 19, what was it, 1982, uh, and has an extraordinarily eminent uh, series of, of lecturers who've come over the years. The first in 1982 was Eric Kandel. Um, and it's gone through uh, last year's Susumu Tanagawa was our lecturer, and uh, in between we've had many luminaries in the fields of uh, psychiatric neuroscience as well as basic neuroscience. And in that tradition, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Guoping Feng here to give the lecture today. Uh, Guoping, um, after doing his, his uh, early training in masters in China, did his PhD at the State University of New York in Buffalo in molecular genetics, and then went to um, Washington University in St. Louis for a postdoc in neurobiology. And he got there at a really remarkable moment in, in the development of the field of, of molecular neurobiology because all of these techniques of using genetically modified mice were just coming to, you know, had been around for, for a while and have been applied in neurobiology for some years, but were really coming to, to fruition. And Guo Ping uh, jumped right in there in, in the middle and, and has been at the center of a, norm, uh, a number of, of really important both technical advances and um, and, and fundamental neurobiological advances. And we're going to hear about the, the, you know, the current wave of those uh, today. Some of uh, Guo Ping's work in mice, I think we're going to hear a lot about primate work today, which I'm really looking forward to because I don't know that work as well. Um, but a lot of his work over the last 20 years has been in genetically modified mice. And I became familiar with this work um, back in 1990s, I guess, I guess it was 2006 when I first heard about the mice, 2007, when one of the first really compelling mouse models that is, that, uh, is, is shedding light on mechanisms of OCD came to light. And I followed Guo Ping's work uh, very closely since then. And have been, uh, if I, I can share just a few, a few personal things I've been struck with. One is that Guo Ping is incredibly generative and generous. Um, he's generated these extraordinary tools, these extraordinary mice, and he's willing to share them very broadly. Um, and that's been really fruitful and cross-fertilizing for the field, including to a lot of young investigators. Um, and that's really impressive, because not everyone who's, who does this you know, sort of ground, groundbreaking work is, and is pushing back the, the boundaries of our field is that generative. So that's, that's one thing I've always been impressed by. Another thing I've been impressed by, given his, his prominence, Guo Ping hasn't published as much as I thought, as I would have thought when I first looked at his CV. And as I look more closely, I realize that's because everything he publishes is really important, is really a comprehensive story that's bringing together lots of things. He waits until he's got something really to say, and then he says it, and it, and it, and it makes a difference. Um, and the final thing is that in addition to, to doing a lot of important neurobiological work, Guo Ping has made a number of technical advances. This goes back to his postdoctoral work at, at uh, Washington uh, university where he did you know, develop new tools for tracing the activity of individual cells, goes on to being on the, the cutting edge of the application of uh, optogenetics to transgenically modified mice. The, he was an early adapter of the CRISPR technology, which we're going to hear about today, and is now using it to push forward into analyzing uh, neuropsychiatric disease and the underlying mechanisms in non-human primates, asking, allowing us to ask questions that mouse systems that have been the cornerstone of this field, of th this corner of neuroscience for 20 years, simply aren't equipped to because they're mice, you know, and there's, there's certain things that they can't do. So that's a really exciting advance. Um, after his postdoc, Guo Ping went to uh, Duke University um, and uh, quickly ran, rose through the ranks there, but then moved in 2010 to the McGovern Institute at, um, at MIT, where he's currently the Pickauer Professor, I believe, um, and is a long list of honors, which I'm not going to go through because I'm eager to get to the talk today. So uh, without further ado, Guo Ping, thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to your talk, and congratulations on the Flynn Lectureship. Thank you, Chris, for a very generous uh, uh, introduction. I'm really honored to uh, give this lecture, and also really honored, especially in front of Yale Psychiatry, the 
the world's most famous and uh, uh, original and uh, also pioneer in psychiatry research and service. I, I can probably be very safe to say without the Yale psychiatry pioneers in this department, many, many things would be very different actually, and much worse in psychiatry. We're still not the, 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 that, but, uh, there yet, but I think this is the place um, I know a lot of you are trainees here. It's a really a, you know, a great place to be. I think I'd always uh, be honored to be here to uh, uh, give talks to a full room of experts. So I'm going away from what I usually do. I usually do is use mice as a model, genetic engineering mice that use a model, study synapse, synapse dysfunction, uh, how synapse dysfunction may contribute to abnormal behavior and their relevance to psychiatric disorders. I'm personally very interested in psychiatric disorders, especially neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, so I have been doing this since um, established my lab uh, in 2000 at, uh, at Duke. And uh, Chris is totally right. I actually don't publish enough. I have been. <laughs> I have been working on monkeys for literally 10 years. I have not published a single paper yet. <laughs> Seriously, and uh, it will come up hopefully soon. In the next few years, you will see some of them. And once I decide to do it, I really want to do it. Uh, I've become a little crazy, just obsessed with it. And I, 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 I'm over-optimistic at what I can do. And, uh, but most of the times, if you work on long enough, you will figure something out. I think it's, hopefully that's useful. And so today I'm going to focus on the, um, some new technologies that are developed in the field and how can we use them to help psychiatric research. And I think it's important to uh, not only realize the advance, but also realize the limitations we have and the failures that we have, uh, we have and how to overcome these failures and uh, hopefully in the future or hopefully not in the near future that we can really understand the psychiatric disorders much better and hopefully to help the development of, of the treatment for, the, uh, de uh, for this for these debil uh, debilitating uh, disorders. And uh, so um, I, I have some disclosure. Um, uh, I try to do uh, you know, uh, mostly in research but um, on the side there's a few things I'm, I'm involved. Uh, uh, especially I um, worked with a group of people, uh, founded a Lujin Therapeutics, to try to use new uh, knowledge we develop to uh, develop treatment and I'm also on advisory board of you. And for research fund also, although I ha have research fund from pharmaceutical companies, but I don't have personal uh, uh, um, benefit from that, just mostly for uh, all, all of them for research. So you, pro uh, you are very clear that um, uh, in such a prominent place that genetic engineering in mice have, has really revolutionized the biomedical research. But uh, so far, its impact on developing uh, you know, treatment for brain disorder has been limited uh, so far. There are many reasons. I'm not blaming mice, and we cannot blame them, uh, <laughs> because we choose to use them. They didn't choose to, 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 uh, to, uh, to be the model. Now, Mice are extremely important. I almost, uh, you know, it's very clear. Every model is very useful if we ask the right question. And so my life is still depend on mice, so I don't want to say anything bad about some mouse models. However, evolutionally, there are some differences. And in particular, uh, there are a few limitations, right? There's a huge difference both in structure and function between rodents and the human brain. And, uh, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, conservation. But there are also a very significant uh, issue of evolution divergence in behavior circuits, right? Every species, uh, we all have unique behaviors because this behavior are evolved to better survive for each species. So mice survive differently from us. So our uh, behavior will be very different from mice or, for, for, or even from monkeys. And because of this difference, the underlying circuits might be very different. They are circuits are highly conserved, for example, motor, vision, maybe uh, uh, more conserved, but they also higher function needed for the species, particularly for that species, maybe not uh, highly conserved. And uh, also there are uh, difficulty in study higher cognitive functions, and I, I can illustrate some when we, ha we talk about these uh, uh, monkey models. And there are also, you know, numerous failures in translating preclinical su success in rodents into clinical trials, and these are uh, there are many reasons. It's not because a mouse is a bad model. Mouse is still a great model, and uh, 
And there is no perfect model, right? Human is the only perfect model for human disease. And, but uh, this, you know, uh, when, uh, there are many different possibilities, but one of the things that we have to think about is that maybe there's some fundamental differences that also contribute to these failures. And uh, uh, th uh, so these are one of the particular area which is, you know, heavily involved in, in many of the psychiatric disorders is the prefrontal cortex function, higher cognitive functions. And these are very you know, small or primitive in, in rodents, but much more advanced and developed in, in, in primates, including, uh, 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 you know, marmoset and macaques. And this is the human picture. So, so, th so th these kind of thinking lead, uh, led me to, um, and many others also think about how, how can we develop additional models for studying neuroscience and especially for uh, uh, brain dysfunctions. So, and you probably are more familiar than me, and this is slides I borrowed from Ed Skolnick, uh, who is the founder of Stanley Center at the Broad Institute. Right? So, mechanistically new drugs uh, in the last 50, 60, uh, 60 years, and we have very little, um, uh, you know, new drug, a few new drugs for, uh, you know, depression, schizophrenia, but we had a lot of um, success in other fields. It's not because of the lack of interest or lack of effort or lack of um, uh, uh, funding, and it's just that, uh, the, the complex of the uh, uh, psychiatric disorders and brain disorders. And uh, there were a lot of hopes uh, uh, just a few years ago. Many farmers now all, uh, uh, you know, um, withdraw or, or, or decide to leave the field of psychiatric disorders. And most recently, the Pfizer sh shutting down. If you are interested in equipment, there are auctions. I heard you can go try to <laughs> bidding. And we got, uh, we got some from um, uh, other companies, actually. So uh, people, were, you are probably very familiar with the Pfizer XM Grow R5 story. And, uh, uh, you know, um, my colleague uh, Mark Baer did beautiful work in mice. Roche did beautiful work in mice. And we actually invited the, the person who, in, who was in charge of a clinical trial to give him a talk at a standing center. He stand up and he said, when, I, when the, the clinical trial failed, all the way, he said, I never ever thought this question, whether this will work. I only was thinking how good it will work, how well it will do in patient. And at the end of uh, the uh, test, there's no signal at all. And so three companies, uh, Novartis did a clinical trial. Of course, Seaside, uh, Mark Baer's company also went under because of failure of this. Um, so there are many reasons. Could it be clinical trial uh, design issues? Could it be a lack of biomarkers? All these things are possible, but there is also a possibility that maybe the mechanistic is very different. And so this was not a surprise, uh, at least because of, of the uh, complex of psychiatric disorder. The surprising thing really uh, scared me was this in last December, right? And this was um, a Pfizer drug, PD-10. And I studied psych uh, uh, striatum. I studied cortical striatum. The reason I studied that was it's highly conserved between species. Even from birds, there's some conservation. Then you mice, rats, monkeys, and, uh, and the humans are highly conserved. So this, if you're interested in uh, 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 disorders use mouse models, this is one of the areas you really, uh, I think it really can be translatable. But, this thing was uh, used to um, cellular uh, P, uh, PD10. PD, you all know very well. If you inhibit it, it will increase high like MP. Then you can. Uh, uh, the cellular mechanism is very clear, and it's highly expressed in striatum. Uh, this is a mouse striatum. So this was designed to treat, uh, improve the symptoms of Huntington's disease. So the field was very excited because there is no drug really can cure Huntington's disease, but if you can improve the symptoms, at least you will make people's life better. And they was very excited, people were very excited. But when this, and this was a neuron paper, very effective in mice. But when this uh, finished clinical trial, even didn't completely finish, that there was no signal at all. So they decided there's no chance, by statistically look at them, there's no chance even you continue, finish the clinical trial, you will have any effect. So they actually find this, stop it. So this was very scary because it's just such a conserved system, it's still not a trend. So of, of course there are many, many different reasons. Um, but if you think about the cortical striatal thalamic cortical circuits, it's not a single point of striatum is highly conserved. It's a whole circuit right? from a cortex, from prefrontal cortex and a motor cortex, sensory cortex to striatum, back to the um, you know, thalamus, then go back to cortex to, to initiate action. So because the cor cortical differences and the whole circuit may be functioning very differently. So, so whatever you're measuring, which in this case is measuring motor activity, would be very different. 
So, so this, this is something that made all of us, or at least many of us, thinking, how can we improve the circuit uh, system, uh, use a, a, a additional models to uh, at least have another layer of testing, maybe it will help us understand what uh, improve the translatability between animal model studies to, uh, to uh, human studies. Because we, and like a cancer you know, uh, research, we cannot easily get human tissues or, or, or test them in human brain. So uh, for, for all these reasons, without saying anything bad to uh, mice, because my life still depends on mice, and we start to think about, we start to actually to think, how can we uh, uh, develop uh, models of, uh, closer to humans? And uh, so we, uh, we rely on actually two different uh, monkeys we're working on, one is a macaque, and one is a marmoset. So macaques, are, uh, we use uh, uh, synos. Uh, the reasons are, 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 are very simple. When we develop a technology, it's not very easy to, to make a knockout knocking in monkeys. And uh, we need to test many different conditions. Um, uh, Rhesus are the most commonly used uh, macaque monkeys in neuroscience research. And you're very, very familiar with a lot of experts here at, uh, at Yale. But, uh, uh, Rhesus are seasonal breeders. They have the only certain amount of uh, months you can do uh, breeding uh, and collect eggs and uh, implant, especially implant them. And synodes are uh, non-seasonal breeding, so you can year, almost year round except for really su hot summer months. Um, so that make it work much faster. And uh, the marmoset, um, also very unique, marmoset uh, is much smaller and uh, so uh, they breed them really, really fast. So they basically they, uh, they have uh, uh, babies twice a year. They have twins or triplets or quadruplets. So, so you, if you think about this, this makes a huge difference when you want transgenic animals, you want to expand a colony, or you want to see whether you have germline transmission. Right? So the sexual mature in a year or a maximum year and a half. This sexual mature in between three and a half to four years. So you have to wait for a long, long time before you know, do you have a transgenic germline uh, uh, modification? And the other advantage for me is I'm particularly interested in, in uh, neurodevelopment disorders and, and autism. So these animals are very, very social. The, the vocal communication, the, the, I will show some videos you can see. They are really, really social. And they, may have a, uh, they, are, they, are, they have a family structure, so they usually, even in wild, they mostly are um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, living in a family. So in, in, in the, uh, at MIT, we give them a large cage. So um, mom give birth, ba uh, daddy take care of babies. Uh, it will uh, carry on their back. So they are, they are very small, they're only 400 gram, but they big, looks big because they're f uh, very furry. And the, the uh, babies will hide in the back of the, so it's really hard to find it because in wild, they want, birds will snatch the babies and eat them, right? So, so that's why they're hiding. And so that I always say, these are much better than me as a daddy because they take care of all the time. I only give the baby to the mom when the baby needs to be fed. So, so moms are in the wild will go you know, uh, fetch food and get, uh, produce milk and daddy. And then when the baby grow up, the, uh, the mom would have another uh, uh, baby. Uh, babies are uh, uh, another um, twins or triplets. And the brother, grow up brother and sister will take care of them because daddy cannot carry you know all the time. So so they are really family structure. So study social behavior is a really uh, very good species actually to study social behavior. Now monkeys uh, have been used for psychiatry for neuroscience research for a long long time. Some of the very most important things are, are the higher cognitive functions or even for Parkinson's disease studies are uh, uh, used the monkeys. Um, the reason it uh, resurgence is because of technology development. You're probably very, very familiar by now that the genome editing technology started with zinc finger many, many years ago, then the uh, tailing, now it's uh, mostly CRISPR. And CRISPR allows us to do basically almost in any uh, species, any cells. Right? So, so that allows us to think about how can we use this technology to, to do the uh, genetic modification, both for knockout and knocking. Uh, in monkey. The reason you can do any species is about high efficiency. Previously, you know, we do mouse and, uh, and the rats, we have to uh, uh, de develop germline transmittable st embryonic stem cells. Then you can manipulate it in stem cell, and then you turn the stem cell into a, in, into a blast cyst, then you implant. And so far, there's no germline transmittable uh, uh, ear cells from monkeys. And people have tried it for many, many years. And so, because 
It's so efficient you can directly inject into embryo, you don't need stem cells. You just inject the CRISPR into fertilized egg and it would, uh, it would modify in this, at the single cell stage, then you have an animal born with the genetic mod uh, modification. So um, I already mentioned that we, uh, at MIT, we mostly focus on marmoset. We, uh, we have done some macaque work, I will show a little bit, uh, with a collaboration uh, with China. Uh, a, a, gr a group in China. The, so far, most, almost all the macaque work, genetic engineering macaque work are from China, and uh, uh, so most of the mom set work are come out from Japan. And these are two uh, areas they had a lot of experience, a lot of uh, resources to work on this. So our goal was to hope that use this new technology, not only make a knockout, mutated gene, but also do a lot of different things that uh, we can model particular uh, disease, genetic conditions in this disease, including deletions, large or small insertions, point mutations, or conditional mutations. But uh, for really understand the circuits and the molecular functions, and we need also cell type specific tools, just like we have all kind of mice. So in the future, we're hoping to have cell type specific Cree lines, or, or, or you know, uh, uh, you know, G camps, or even channel robsins. All these are now feasible, uh, possible. And uh, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, the first set of the uh, reporting of successful knockout are from two groups from China, especially uh, with the cheese lab from Kunming, and, um, and the mom said it was from uh, uh, Okano and Sasaki's lab in Japan, Keio University and o Central Institute for um, Experiment Animal. We're all co we collaborate very closely with our mom said with, uh, uh, with uh, Eric and uh, um, Hideoki's group in, in Japan. Now, so n making knockout seems uh, relatively easy, but making kn knocking is uh, much more difficult. So this is even in mice. These are just published last year, uh, not 2016, about uh, you know um, basically CRISPR is taking over to for. Uh, uh, from the ESLs to make models, but it turned out making knocking is still really, really low, uh, efficiency low. So, uh, low. so uh, people in, uh, uh, so, uh, so that's, that was the problem. Uh, if it's such a low in mice, it might be okay. You can inject hundreds of eggs, and then we got a few uh, positive, that's fine. But we don't have that luxury in monkey. Right? So, so monkey, you have least, at least probably you need to about 50, 40, 30 to 50% efficiency, then you can, um, have half of the animals and, uh, are muted, have, have maybe uh, your controls. So, um, uh, uh, Tamami uh, Ada in my lab actually uh, developed a technology. This was actually before he joined the lab, he developed in Japan. He was in uh, Tokyo Medical uh, uh, College in, 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 in Japan. So, he basically uh, uh, used the crystal structure, which was uh, uh, um, uh, was solved by one of his collaborators, uh, figured that in the normal conditions to for, for easy use packaging, actually we link the guide RNA to, uh, uh, with a link to uh, uh, guide RNA and the, the, um, the uh, CRISPR and, and, and transactive RNA together into one called a single guide, uh, you know, guide RNA. And because you can pack the whole thing in virus or in make a single, it turned out uh, based on the structure analysis, if you separate this, which is native condition, uh, the efficiency may be much higher. So that was the idea. And then use a Cas9 protein instead of RNA, maybe also increase efficiency. efficiency. So uh, he actually showed that th this actually is much more efficient when he used this. So he tested in mice to begin with. And so, what he found is that if you use a single strand template, which you can synthesize, and you synthesize the CRISPR RNA, which match the D D DNA you want to uh, modify, then you use this transactive RNA, which activated the Cas9, and you use protein, all mix them together. So he called it cloning free, because you can just buy Cas9, uh, order the synthetic oligos, and then synthesize the single strand of DNA. You don't need to do actually any cloning. And I found that the knocking efficiency now reached in mouse embryo 50%. So that seems like high enough for us to do in <coughs> trying monkeys. So we decided to try in monkeys. The first thing we tried is um, try to make a, a macaque or, or mammoth uh, 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 monkeys with uh, 
PV uh, uh, cre uh, knock into the PV locus. So um, you, you all know PV neurons are, are very important, uh, not only for the function, but also have been implicated in many psychiatric disorders. Some of the expert work are done here, uh, including uh, Chris's work in, in the striatum. So you can, uh, so we try to see, can we have a cell type specific cre that it, for many, many labs can use, you can inject, uh, you know, uh, channel absence, or you can inject uh, um, uh, you know, calcium uh, uh, g caps to imaging this specific group of neurons in different conditions. So we designed this uh, and inject into fer fer fertilized uh, monkey embryos to see how what can we get the efficient. Basically, after injection, we culture them, let them culture into the uh, 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 um, uh, you know, multi-cell stage between 80 to 100 cells, then we collect them to genotype them. What we found was very surprising. The efficiency is really high. It's about 60 to 70 percent. So now these are some of, now we did more injecting, these are, are, are actually implanted. So we were waiting for the birth of these monkeys and hopefully this will give us the first cell type specific cre line in, in macaque and marmoset uh, monkeys. And we also tried, uh, many of the tools in mice are extremely useful because of the cell type specific manipulations, right? Like channel adoptions also. So we see whether we, can we do a conditional um, knocking of, of this super sensitive uh, red shifted uh, ch uh, channel adoption which develop uh, at boiling uh, at MIT. And if we can make a conditional, then you can inject the virus, Cre virus, into any region and activate this. Then you can do optogenetic uh, manipulation in different brain regions, whatever the region you are. So we, knock, we try to knock you into a locus. In mice, we use Rosa, Rosa 26. In monkeys, there's a, um, uh, and human, there's a called AAVS wing site, which has been shown that almost like a Rosa 26 can have you, uh, you know, um, ubiquitous expression. And we found that, so, so we synthesized, designed this and synthesized the single-stranded uh, template. And the same thing, we found a very high efficiency, about 40% uh, in monkey embryos. So, so this allows us to make, you know, not only cell type specific, but also conditional uh, alleles in, 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 uh, in monkeys. This actually, not all these are uh, Im, uh, implanted. So what the difficult part for monkey is they are, long reproduction cycle, right? So if you say, I want to knock out the gene specifically, specifically in Cre neurons, which people have done a lot of them, right? And uh, tell us a lot of very important information, then you have to make a Cre, PV Cre, make a conditional allele, wait for four years they are mature, breed them, and each year you may get one, and then I think most of graduates by that time probably already quit their program. So, and so that was our concern. So we, so Tomomi decided, why don't we just do one injection, both? Maybe we will get efficient enough to have both of them. So he tried to say, okay, if you want to specifically activate uh, use channel rupsing or PV neuron in a particular brain area, if you have a mouse that can do that, then you can just optical fiber into wherever you have, you only activated the PV neuron in that area. So he decided to, he designed PV knocking with the uh, uh, you know, conditional uh, uh, channel robson knocking into one embryo. Can we get you know, both of them into one same single uh, 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 monkeys? And this, surprisingly, this was uh, effective. Actually, at least we can get 20% of embryos <coughs> ever. Now, only 20, that means you implant 10, you only have potentially two. So that's still very low efficient. So um, we actually went, to, I, I personally went to MGH and uh, AAV, uh, uh, IVF uh, clinic, talked to the doctor, then I visited them for a day. And there's a very easy PGD, you know, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. You basically take one cell out during four to, uh, eight cell stage and freeze the embryo and you, and genotype that, uh, uh, that cell, and then you pick a good one, and you implant a human, it's totally fine. So we actually develop, our collaborator together, we develop this technology, so we can just actually let it grow into eight cell stage, or even blast stage. At the blastosis stage, you don't have to take an embryonic cell, you take the uh, trophoblast, the supporting cell, take a few out, and you can uh, actually uh, genotype them, and now um, these some of the positive of implants. So all this technology seems like uh, solved. If this is successful, you can tell, and um, you don't have to wait until the founder, both founders, get into uh, you know three or four years 
uh, sexual mature, then they breed, double header, they breed into conditional knockout. You can just, in one injection, you have both, you can have conditional knockout or conditional knocking. So we think this is totally feasible to do um, uh, uh, right now, and in the future, it will be become more and more, um, uh, 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 more and more easier because of technology development in the, in the uh, pre-implant uh, uh, genetic diagnosis. Now, the CRISPR is only one part. And uh, there are many aspects involved in making a, 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 a genetic engine uh, primate. And many of the areas have been well studied in IVF clinic. And so we actually learned a lot. And they have very sophisticated equipment and really, really helping us. So we actually use most of their equipment and because of the quality and the, and the, the uh, the, the development of the effort they have put into and the experience they have learned from. So basically you need egg donors, right? you need sperm donors, and then you in vitro fertilize, you do pre-nuclear or pro, uh, cytoplasmic injection of CRISPR, and you in vitro culture this embryo, and you can monitor them, the good ones that the, uh, uh, you can take some out, uh, one cell out uh, to genotype them, and you freeze the embryo, uh, if you are, if like PV cre now we reach 100% uh, knocking, we don't have to do this uh, diagnosis anymore. We just implant them all. Once above 50%, because you need to control that anyway, so you, you actually can direct the implant, and then you're waiting for the, uh, uh, for the uh, um, uh, birth. So there are many of the equipment that are particularly used for, especially this um, um, you know, embryo culture dish uh, machine. You can actually watch the... Um, You can actually watch the um, uh, uh, embryo cell division, right? Two cell, and so you monitor the timing whether they are delayed or not, so you know the quality of this embryo which you want to implant. As so you can see, and they, 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 uh, this is live. You can watch them on the screen, and then you pick which which embryo you can implant. So this is dramatically. This is a clinical. They use uh, MGH. Uh, they do uh, they do this for human IVF. So we learned a lot from them. I'm very grateful to they allow us to actually watch all these different procedures. You, they, not in patient part, but in the lab part, allow us to watch them. So when these embryos, so we basically, um, f after fertilizer, we do pro-nuclear stage injection. Then you divide, and by eight cell stage, you can either take a cell or you can directly transfer. And some of them we don't transfer, then we can let them grow into blastocyst and to genotyping and to understand the, the, uh, the efficiency. So, I'm, so these are kind of technology now. It's pretty mature. So many of the uh, 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 labs, I think, it can be, uh, if you're interested, we'll be uh, very happy. Many uh, actually universities have come to our facility to, to learn different uh, aspects of this, and we're very happy to you know, uh, disseminate or give to anyone, teach anyone who wants to establish the system. Now I'm going to give a little example of how this can be used for us to actually study the psychiatric disorders. So my lab uh, are very interested in uh, synapse development. Shang Tsui is one of the protein scaffolding protein critical for the assembly of postsynaptic complex. And Shang Tsui um, also, there are three shanks, and uh, they are all very important for synapse development. But Shang Tsui is the only one highly expressed striatum. So that's why we started with, with the Shang Tsui. And uh, Shang Tsui mutation has been uh, 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 directly linked to the fetal McDermott syndrome, which is a deletion of a small uh, um, um, uh, chromosome area 20 to Q, wing 3.3. And called, uh, but later on, studies show that the main neurological defect or behavior defect caused in, by this deletion fetal, uh, fetal McDermott syndrome is by Shang Tsui mutation. And later on, uh, Thomas Bojan's lab um, have uh, um, uh, identified many mutations in the Shang Tsui gene itself in autism spectrum disorder. So, so a recent study by Joe Buxbaum at uh, Monsanto showed that about 85 or 84 percent of our patients uh, with the Shang Tsui mutation uh, or uh, uh, fetal McDermott syndrome uh, deletion uh, actually can be diagnosed with autism or autism spectrum uh, disorder. So this is a kind of monogenic gene, uh, uh, gene that deletion or, or mutation can cause severe neurodevelopment disorder with um, uh, autism spectrum uh, features. 
and I don't have to say that you, you all know very, very familiar um, some of the uh, design of, of this diagnosis for the autism and two aspects, you know, social deficit, communication deficit and repetitive and restricted interest. So we decided to, can we, so many of labs, including my lab, uh, did a lot of work in using mouse models. So we, we uh, you know, um, uh, we uh, uh, did a, not only developmental studies, also compared the, the uh, Shanksui mutations in ASD and schizophrenia. We also did a rescue to see uh, when is Shanksui required during development. Um, uh, can you rescue all the phenotypes when, when you put the gene back, um, potentially to understand the, the future of gene therapy? But um, it turned out that some of the, you, some of aspects you can rescue, some of you cannot, so they are, they are act definitely developmental aspect involved, and many other labs also studied the shank three. So we have a quite good understanding of shank three, the fun cellular function in mice. The difference is in mice actually, uh, in humans are all heterozygous. Uh, I don't think anyone, I talked to Thomas uh, Bourgeois many times, no one has ever found a uh, homozygous. And we don't know why, because maybe the chance is too low. But in mice, heterozygous almost have very little phenotypes actually. And homozygous, if you just uh, look at them, it's very hard to tell. Right? They're still running around, but if you test them, they have very anxious, they have um, uh, different uh, uh, problems, they have sensory problems and uh, other problems. And so we want to see whether uh, use, um, for example, one of the major issues in the uh, in the Shanksui mutation is the intellectual disability, right? very severe. In mice, we test all kinds of things. We couldn't figure out anything they cannot learn. It's, just, it's a homozygous mutation, so this, maybe they are too dumb to begin with, and there's nothing to disable them. And so it's, <coughs> that's my guess. I, it's very hard to say why we couldn't detect. And I talked to Hilda Zagabi, who is also who is an expert in the field. She says she tested many, many of these um, mouse models, and none of them she can find any uh, learning disability um, in, in, in the mice. So, so we so maybe this is more involved in, in you know peripheral cortex or, or other higher cognitive functions. So we decide to see what can we, in principle, generate a monkey model that test some of the things we cannot or difficult to test in mouse. And what we found is, so we started with our collaboration with uh, Professor Sihua Yang in, uh, in in China, Southern Agricultural University of uh, of China. And uh, he, is, uh, uh, he was the first, uh, per, uh, one of the authors who, uh, who actually developed the first uh, GLP transgenic monkey uh, uh, in the world, actually, G uh, germline transmission. And uh, so we actually designed all these things. Uh, 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 one of my poster, Yan Zhou, designed CRISPR, and we found a very efficient knockout uh, to mimic this mutation which is the funding, uh, is, it's an insertion uh, or deletion, it's a frame shift mutation in exon 21 and almost eliminated all, we showed in mice uh, and in culture neuron, eliminated almost all the isoforms of the Shang Tsui. And we were very lucky actually, we, have, we had uh, five uh, uh, mutant monkeys, two homozygous and uh, three heterozygous. Now, uh, we are lucky to have, they are mosaicism, which means although you have homozygous, some of them are one, one type of deletion was another deletion packed together into one monkey embryos, uh, one monkey. But we're also very lucky we have pure homozygous deletion, which is 40 base pair, which will cause a frame shift. We also have a pure uh, heterozygous mutation, which is um, also 40 base uh, pair deletion, uh, lead to a frame shift. So that's very uh, similar to the frame shift we found in, 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 in uh, not way, um, Thomas found in human patients. So we are not, we are very, uh, uh, so because no one has really studied the um, genetic mutation of, 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 uh, in a monkey for autism. So we, I have to tell you, I don't know what I'm looking at. And no, none of us, so we're all learning. So I, if you have good suggestions, I'm very, I will be very uh, um, grateful you can tell. I'll just show you some things we found is really interesting. Um, and we probably have to change things, how we look at a monkey behavior. So one thing is repetitive behavior. Um, they don't do a single repair behavior. They do all kinds of things. Some monkeys just flip all the time. Some are just uh, licking the, the, the metal bars all the time. They do all kinds of weird things. So if you put them together, you see, even heterozygous, you see a very significant increase in this repetitive behavior. Homozygous won't have two, so it's hard to say significant or not, but you can see they do a lot of more uh, repetitive behavior. And one other thing we are particularly interested in is to look at their, uh, you know, uh, eye contact 
uh, so we can do eye tracking in monkeys. I, I don't think we can do mice because they're eye on the side. They don't look at it eye to eye. So, so the monkeys, they, have, they pay a lot of attention to, to the facial area. Right? People have studied the normal monkey. They focus on the, because um, facial expression is a signal. It's a social signal. It's a threat also to them. They have to pay attention. So we, um, what we found is interesting is that these monkeys, uh, we, we can do eye tracking and look at, uh, give them different pictures or videos. And they actually look at more, they stare at more on, on these uh, videos or pictures than the Y type. And so some other studies from here and show that maybe they have some issues with disengagement. We don't know at the same because the human and monkey are really different. We cannot get into their mind to know what. But from the surface, if you show a monkey, if there is a monkey, aggressive monkey faces, most of the monkey will pay a lot of attention because that's a threat to them. And that's shown in Y type. Right, if you wire type, you look at, uh, show them aggressive monkey faces, neutral and submissive. They put mo po uh, pay most attention to the uh, aggressive faces and less to the neutral, very little to the submissive. But for the mutant monkey, they don't distinguish them. They're just all the same. Right? So the, um, on average, they have mo watch more time, but they don't distinguish them. So, so that so means they, maybe they cannot really distinguish this emotional state, or they don't care. Right? So that's kind of thing, if this is true, if it's rep robust, rep reproducible, if we can have a treatment to solve this problem, it might be possibly that more translatable than other measurement of you know, sniffing other mouses behind, which is what we usually use for the social behavior in our studies. And uh, so the other thing we just started learning is about, uh, social behavior, right? So we basically pair them with strange monkeys. You put the two together to see how they interact. And so this is a summary which is very misleading. It's an interesting way of learning. So it's called a Hindi index, which you see who is responsible for initiating the social interaction. The negative value, so, this, so, so you can tell this, they are different between white type and a mutant, right? But the, 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 or the, the direction is the opposite of what we saw. The negative means they are more responsible for initiating the interaction. So that's the opposite from what. So what we found is that it's really strange behavior. There are two things. One is if you put two monkeys together, usually what is the first thing? These are all I've learned in the last uh, couple of years. These monkeys are only two, uh, a little over two years old. We started very, very, uh, when they are very uh, uh, young. What a monkey you put together, they will stare at each other, they will you know, just judge, should I interact with you or not? I mean, it's just like a human, you put two kids in the playground, they're not gonna hug each other if they never met it before, they're gonna watch and then they start to interact. So these monkeys are like this. They were, then gradually they were getting closer, then they start to play. The mutant monkey, we cannot tell which is mutant because by looking at them, the head of zygote, homozygous you can. Homozygotes are very disabled. They actually, they, they, they don't walk, they, they have motor coordination problem, which is the same thing in human patients, actually. But the, the, the heterozygotes, you, we cannot tell which, you cannot just say, oh, this must be mute. But if you look at the behavior, you will know they are maybe different. So the monkeys are very, very sensitive. The white type monkey can immediately tell, I don't want to be with this monkey. They will just go away. But the mutant, mutant monkey, when you put them in with a white type, they have no sense that I should watch. They just immediately wander around and bump into the other mutant, white monkey. My white monkey will just run away. So that's uh, understand why the, many of the initiated abides, they don't respect the, 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 you know, the initial distance or initial like, you know, strange uh, uh, evaluation phase. They just do whatever they want to do. So this is something we are still trying to learn. And so eventually we decide we want to see reciprocal interaction, whether it's this uh, initial, whether you have a reciprocal, then we found that uh, you have very little reciprocal interaction. Although the monkey can, mutant monkey bump into the white type monkey, but uh, they don't receive the reciprocal interaction for other monkey. If the white type monkey come to the mutant monkey, they all don't, don't so re receive. So there are a lot of new things that we are, we are, uh, we are learning, but uh, we can tell their social interactions, they are abnormal. And whether we can eventually figure out something, we don't know. But I think if this is the case, maybe we can go on um, to figure out what is circuits that really uh, control this. So there are a lot of things ongoing we are, we are trying to study. And so basically we are going, uh, we, we just finished the testing cognitive function. I have to say they are, in, they, they are, um, they are capable of doing basic learning 
uh, WGTA, uh, like you know, very famous uh, study here, they can do that. Uh, we are starting to do more um, uh, complicated uh, uh, cognitive function, and they start to showing some differences. Only so, so imagine you water maze and mice; they have no problem at all in shanks homozygous. But in heterozygous, in, uh, in these monkeys, you, you already start to maybe see a, a, a trend of, of difference. We only have three monkeys, so it's really hard to make the statistics significantly yet. But homozygous, they are really they cannot do any of these things. So suggesting that indeed the mutation of Shang three are much more severe in monkeys compared to in mice, and probably uh, humans are, are even more severe. So there are some uh, high cognitive functions that are, are maybe more uh, unique to humans than even to monkeys. And we do a lot of other things that we are hoping to. Uh, we are now just starting to getting sperms from the, uh, the, the funders. They are three and a half years old now, so we are actually generating, we have a very good, our collaborator is very good to generate this, uh, IVF monkeys, so we can have 10 or 20. Now we, soon we have a large scale of these monkeys, we can look at a videotaping, uh, videotaping them from very, how they interact with their parents, with their brothers, all these things now can be tested uh, in the near future. Now, uh, monkeys are very, very, uh, these are really expensive to study, um, that we cannot do it here because we don't have enough space or resources to do this. We collaborate with a large facility in China uh, with them, and many of our um, people can go there, guide their studies. They are, these are all ALAC accredited places, so we can get approval from even from uh, our uh, MIT uh, ALAC, then we can start to doing the, uh, the work. But at MIT, we focus on the marmoset, and, and this is, we're hoping that uh, in the future become a, a national resource. Like, um, and like you know, mice, these are too expensive, too time consuming to, for every university to establish. So, so our goal is, unlike mice, we usually general mice, when we are ready to publish, we share the mice, we divide the Jackson. This one, after, as soon as we generate, we confirm, we have them, we're gonna ship to anyone who wanna study them because the waiting is just way too long. So, so that's our goal, we're hoping to, to do that. So, they are, uh, they are uh, reproduction much, much faster. So we actually, um, you know, we have done a lot of different things. I'm not gonna go through all this. And uh, I wanna show some of the features of marmoset. Uh, this is the comparison in scale. Human, uh, rhesus, you know, um, marmoset, rat. And so marmoset is, is uh, you know, not as, you know, it's a smoother. So it's a good and a bad. They, they may not refract these. Um, I'm not totally sure this is scale. Maybe it's not scale, <laughs> in scale. Um, so, so, this is, uh, so, so they are quite, quite smooth. So this is good for calcium imaging or other things and uh, optogenetic stimulations. Of, of course, there are also some of the features that uh, may be lost. And uh, so we have done a lot of basic behavior and uh, analysis. For example, they also like, uh, you know, humans, they, they focus more on eyes. They also have a gaze, uh, gazing. So if you show them this, then you turn and the mom said will follow them. So they all have this kind of uh, uh, test that we can do. And their behavior, they're very, very rich, much richer than the uh, mouse. And uh, so, so this is, uh, they are playing, right? So, so this is their home cage, our MIT home cage, uh, their home cage, their parents, their babies, and all. So they, they play a lot. And, and this can be this is this is monitored uh, in, in, in the system, and we can analyze uh, and these behaviors. And uh, so they also have uh, food sharing, and the food sharing is also really interesting because they only share with younger ones, and the bigger ones they are fighting with you. So this is like this this monkey has a, um, uh, food, and then there's one from the the baby from the uh, it will give the food to share, but it will not share with these bigger ones they will fight with. All these things, and this is very interesting behavior, but it also create a problem for us if we give drugs, medicine to the, uh, the bigger, and the, the baby will take it, because it will share with the baby. So that's <laughs> become a problem, so we have to block the baby and give it the medicine. And so we do, a, 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 so there are a lot of things you can do uh, for, for this complex behavior. We set up systems, allow we, you know, these monitorings and, and also screens for uh, um, uh, um, iPad kind of uh, uh, touch screen assays, right? And so, uh, so they can do very quick touch screen assays compared to the, uh, to the mice. And so we also set up uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, automatic tracking because we, we don't want to 
people watch monkey videos all the time to, uh, to score them. So we work with AI uh, uh, expert at MIT, uh, John Fisher, and he's a student. And so we're tracking this behavior. So this is a behavior, 3D behavior tracking. The computer is tracking this mom set. You see they're pretty uh, uh, accurate. Uh, you can track the head and the tails. And, and, and so this is, try so this is, um, so you can track it pretty well. Where the, it's much harder than tracking human because human we don't jump around. This mom said it's like three D tracking, so it's much more difficult. So we have to solve a lot of problem. And uh, this you can track them with their body parts because for social interaction you want to distinguish do they you know uh, kiss or hug with the other monkeys. All these things you have to check. So this is the body part. Try to recognize the body part. We are not there yet, but it's pretty good. You can recognize different body parts: tails, you know, bodies and legs and and head and nose. And so this is um, uh, still ongoing. This is, uh, can you track in two mom sets together? So the computer label, one is red, one is, you can see that these are tracking two mom sets. Sometimes get confused still, like mix it together, but you, most of the time you can track it very, very well. And, and so this is just, you know, look at them at a different angles you can track them. And uh, with, so, so all this with the machine learning, with the, with the uh, 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 artificial intelligence uh, programs with uh, MIT uh, uh, AI lab, we, can, we are pretty confident that we can get this solved. And we also developed uh, uh, many of the uh, tracking their vocal communication. Uh, Mama said, unlike many other animals, right? If you have one dog bark, every dog starts barking. Mom said it's like us. When talk, everyone being quiet. And <laughs> until that, mom said finish talking, finish calling, then the other mom will respond. So, so there's a study she showed the mom said are very polite, like so, more polite than some, some of us. Right? So, <laughs> uh, uh, in the social con uh, context, right? So, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, you know, we developed a, a, a vocal tracking system. We have a, a, a uh, a vest, they can have uh, uh, microphones, or uh, we can microphone outside. This is just showing uh, a mom set of calls and two mom different mom set. And I don't know whether you can hear it, but you can see here they have 12 different calls stress calls, you know, all the, and you can test it. You take one out, one start calling, right? And you take, because you're a pair of male or female, you take one out, one start calling, then the other will call back. And all these differences, and we can monitor the baby calling moms, all the differences you can do. So you can also, um, we have tracking, so we can also look at where they are calling, what's the distance, all these things you can do. And the most importantly, for mom said we can do high cognitive uh, test. So this is uh, developed by uh, Elias, uh, uh, who was a postdoc, Jim DeCarlo is a postdoc. Jim DeCarlo is a uh, German chair of our, our neurobiology, uh, brings cognitive science. He not just recently, uh, uh, haven't published this, but got a job at Columbia University. Now we uh, actually let him took some of the uh, mom said he, so he's not st start up a mom said colony at Columbia. And so, so basically, all the systems are in cage because mom said are very stressful. If you take them out of the test, it takes a long time to train them. So we develop a system, let them in-house, in their own cage to test. Right? So this is, yeah, you can see this is the screen, and this is mom said, and they can learn very quickly. I, I, I found they do faster than me, actually. So I will show you this uh, video. Right? So basically, this mom said they needed to, uh, to get a drink, uh, juice, uh, touch a human, uh, 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 see, uh, very eager to touch it. Right? So, uh, and after a while, you will learn which one should touch, I will get the juice. Right? So right now, it's a training, so it's a randomly touch. But eventually, you will learn very quickly. You can do many, many tests of this. So, so in their home cages, they are now anxious. So, so many of the different things that we have been trying, and we need uh, more and more people to work on this to figure out the basics of this me uh, mechanistic. So it, you see, it will t uh, touch very quickly and try to understand which one I touch will get the juice. And once the train, then you can test the different uh, conditions. So we now have very successfully generated um, different uh, mutations. So this is Shank 3, right? So we did the Shank 3. We actually initially, before we had uh, a lot of moms, and we uh, worked with um, uh, Jim Pickle at the uh, uh, NMH. They had, have a small colony. We test the, use, their, uh, use their embryos, and we figure out a way. Now we have our own uh, mom set. Uh, actually, Shang Tsui mutations uh, actually implanted um, already, and this is. And we also had a Cree, 
And this showed a pregnant mom cell with PV Cree, and you see the heartbeat. So, so we are on our way to actually uh, have these uh, monkeys soon, and we'll be happy to share with anyone who is interested um, uh, uh, using these mice to, to figure out some of the mechanisms. And we also um, be able to generate a, a knocking of rep repetitive sequence. For example, Huntington's, Fragile X, these are all repetitive sequence, really difficult to knock in. So we have shown that we can very efficiently knock in these uh, Huntington repeat. This is 78 or 76 repeats, and you can see very high efficiency in knocking. So, so this allow us to study if the really recapitulate of the neuronal death in the stridum, understand before they have a symptom, which stage, what kind of change lead to the uh, cellular molecular change lead to the uh, neuronal death. So, um, so, um, so, so um, this is just kind of uh, overview what we have been doing, and we know there are opportunities, but there are also challenges. In the future, we'll have many models with cell type specific genetic tools. <laughs> we'll also have many, we call it disease models with exact human mutations, right? Whether they were recapitulated the condition, we don't know, but at least we can recapitulate the genetic mutations because the genes are very highly conserved between these species. But there are also a lot of challenges. We have cost technology barrier, uh, to set up a system for each individual lab is not possible. Each individual university um, uh, you know, uh, may not be possible. So how do we you know, um, overcome these barriers and make really freely accessible to a lot of uh, uh, places? And, and also, monkeys are like mice. You can do 25 or 40 to do a behavior, and you may uh, the, the, uh, you know, small uh, numbers are not very small. Can we really have uh, real-time sharing of data to pull together to do much more and more efficiently? And uh, there are also ethical concerns. What kind of model can you generate? Should you want? We should not generate a model because we can. Right? We, it's only because we need, really need this model to help us understand the disease. So all this has to be regulated or, or, or agreed on. And uh, so there are diff different, we had a, um, called um, a, a, a um, Cavalry Futures meeting to try to, to discuss how do we solve these, uh, these problems. I think there are a lot of interest in the field to, to work together. And so, um, finally, I want to acknowledge the people who did all this work. This actually is not my, uh, my lab work. These are the, uh, large collaborations we have, um, including especially Feng Zhang for the CRISPR, Bob Desmo uh, and Steve Hyman. Uh, Bob Desmo is for the, for the uh, primate work, and Steve Hyman is the director of Stanley Center for the support, and many other people involved, especially Sihua Yang from China for the macaque uh, collaboration. We have many, many unbelievable support. Uh, you can imagine. It's not possible to get, like, for me to get a grant to support all this. Well, it costs very costly. And we have many, many faculties involved. And it, our support almost at the beginning is all from uh, private, from McGovern Institute, from Stanley Center, from Poetry Center, and recently from Tan Yang Center for Autism Research. And we also get a, a different support from even local Massachusetts Life Science Center, give us the money to set up all the facilities. And also we have many of the uh, uh, private donors to help us to, to set up a system. Um, thank you. Yes. So we we have completed the, the um, structure MI so far for the Shang Tsui. Um, at least for the homozygous monkey, we can see striatum enlarged right now. But we only have two monkeys, so we really need to next generation. The uh, the heterozygous we are still analyzing because homozygous you can see it by visual look at them. And so we have not finished the analysis of the heterozygous uh, monkeys uh, uh, yet, but we have finished the data collection. Yes. yes. Uh, it's really incredibly exciting. And, um, I guess Thank you. one of the things that also differentiates your monkeys from your mice, I suspect, is that your mice are inbred and yeah. your monkeys are oh, right. very heterogeneous. Yeah. And it seems to me that there's a big opportunity there to help us with a problem that we have in human genetics of psychiatric disorders like autism. 
which is that there's a belief that maybe the background of common variance influences the expression of traits attributable now to single rare mutations. I wondered if you thought about that. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, the inbred mice cause a lot of problem for our shank uh, uh, actual phenotypes. And so we usually cross them out to, to mix the background, like two at least, right? So, um, this is, so we have been doing, so we decided to do the exactly your question in mom set. So we have sequenced every mom set we have because we are abroad. So they said it's much cheaper, just sequence them all. I said, can we design a chip? So the chip is much more expensive because unless you have thousands of them, it's easier to do whole genomes. So we have sequenced the whole genome of uh, so not everything because the, 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 the offspring you don't have to sequence them. You know if you know their parents. So we sequence almost 80 now. And there are two things that are interesting. They are very heterogeneous. You can pair, compare with every single colony uh, uh, somewhere else. We compare with Japan, Wisconsin, all these things. And they are different. And, <coughs> You can help you to select the breeding them as outbred as possible. The second thing, we also found, just like humans, rare mutations in the genes we are really interested in. So now we don't have to make a knockout. We are, it's already there. <laughs> so our goal was to, these are byproducts. Our goal is to understand their polymorphism. Then with the heterozygous mutation you put in, you can look at are there you know, different phenotypic changes that you can track them back to the, that's exactly uh, what we're doing. This is a very good question, yes. The, the, the second question is um, that uh, in your um, uh, knockout uh, monkeys, uh, I couldn't quite tell whether they are reactive to just interesting sensory stimuli versus the social in terms of being pro-stimulus versus pro-social. In other words, if you put a shiny uh, object, neutral object, that wasn't mm -hmm. a social yeah. uh, object, are they more inquisitive about those objects? A very good question. So we are testing them. So what we found is that they are very sensitive to anything changing. Yeah. So if you initially show a film to the uh, white eye monkey, they will look. To the mutant monkey, they will startle and scream. And then they will come down to look at them. So initial changes. So we try to figure out what does that mean. And I, we talked many times that we haven't figured out. <laughs> what are they, why they are so scared of this initially, you change something different. Because in, in, with autistic patients, they'll often be very distracted by a shiny plug in the wall yeah, or a lamp right. that's, mm -hmm. that's bright, as opposed to paying attention to the social stimulus. And, and it's also related, my question was also related to a syndrome you're probably familiar with called Williams syndrome yeah. mm -hmm. in humans, which may have some reciprocal gene relationships yes. with some Yeah, so, th so, so this, these are great questions. That's this kind of input. So, I, so we have not done a lot of detail because we only have three monkeys. Now we're going to have a home, uh, lots of heterozygous, uh, use exactly the same mutation, and we also have different mutations. So we're hoping that anyone who are interested Send me an email. I will be really happy to collaborate with anyone. I, we we want to make this available to anyone who wants to study particular questions. Or, um, you know, we our goal generally these monkeys for to understand disease, not just for my lab to study them. So, um, I don't know. I, I frankly, I don't know how to study them yet, <laughs> because this is new. It never happened before. So we we try to learn from mouse studies, and from uh, initially uh, my poster want to design three chamber. I, we cannot just use the mouse and try to ask a monkey to do switch them. So we have to change our thinking because we have been working with mice for so long, we really have to change our thinking, more talking to clinical uh, scientists, psychiatrists, to, uh, who, are, who really understand the, uh, the, the disease, and hopefully that will advance our understanding. So a lot of things I actually don't know. Well, it's been really wonderful talk and exciting stuff. One way to move to, to get more rapid advances out of all of this investment you put in is to do studies using your behavioral tracking and using your understanding of the genetics and of the behaviors of the, of the marmosets that don't require genetic modification. Right. For example, stress responses yes. and, mm. and things like that mm. in, in parallel, in place of the genetics, but in parallel and more rapidly than can be done with the genetic modification, which led me to wonder, first of all, are you doing that kind of thing? If people looked at chronic stress effect in the marmosets, do marmosets get depressed? 
Is yeah. that a parallel line of work that this could be good that could simulate? Yeah. Well? yeah, very, very good question. So uh, they are very stressful. So it's a great model for stress because almost all, you know, mice are extremely stressful. They live in holes because they worry that every day. They go, I don't think, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right, so, so evolutionarily, maybe, you know, uh, some of animals cannot get depressed. They'll be eaten by other animals, right? So, so all these depressed animals are eliminated right, if you have a mutation. But uh, some are like humans, we can. We, we can have a period of, you know, protected period. So, uh, uh, Angela Roberts studied that in marmoset. She's a world expert on the marmoset behavior. She studied the um, uh, uh, depression in really interesting study. Have not been published. I heard her, uh, her talk. Basically, instead of using, you know, tail suspension or other things, she just measured the physiological response. I think it was a really cool idea. It's because when we use sucrose, how much do they drink the mice? But what is her idea is uh, that it's not how much you eat. It's the expectation, excitement that you have good things to drink. That's the thing missing from the depressing patient. And you can measure with heart rate in humans. And she measured the same thing in mom said, you can see that. And then you modify things, then that thing will disappear. And so, so I think there are a lot of things to explore. We have not studied that yet, but I'm, we are very interested in collaborating with her to look at the uh, stress and anxiety and the depression uh, aspect. Can we really generate uh, you know, a better model for study uh, physio, uh, circuits? But a lot of these social interactions that you're measuring have got good ecological validity, you know, much better than how much sucrose do you drink for? Right. So for social, we are doing is we are doing uh, social interaction, uh, visual social, but at the same time doing uh, MRI scanning, a uh, function MRI to figure out which area in the mouth is activated, and then we can start to manipulate different areas to look at how they change the social interaction. That just started in Bob Desmond's lab. Thank you. <laughs>